about yourself, uh, Dr. Schreier. Uh, how did uh, you come to start Blackhawk TMS? Blackhawk TMS began in 2013, a few years after I'd seen the first Neurostar, uh, which was really the leader of the field, the first the first machine uh, okayed by the uh, approved by the uh, FDA. And uh, I thought it was smoke and mirrors at first. I thought it was uh, junk science and uh, snake oil. And uh, I thought that for quite some time until I started hearing more and more stories about people getting well, people who had been on, on medications for years and had not responded. I think the term treatment-resistant depression is really a misnomer. It's treatment non-responsive because treatment-resistant depression sounds like you're suggesting that the person, the patient, is resistant to treatment. No, they weren't resistant to treatment they weren't able to respond to the treatment provided. TMS gave them the opportunity to respond to treatment because it accessed a part of the brain that had never been touched before. So that is a very interesting phenomenon and a very interesting way to perceive how treatment should be done. To turn on the neurons that have not been firing, to alleviate depression, to decrease anxiety, and to promote wellness in a very integrative method. How do you describe TMS to new patients coming in and seeing it or having it for the first time? When someone calls in and says, tell me a little bit about what is transcranial magnetic stimulation? First thing I tell them, it is not shock therapy. It is not inducing electricity into your brain in any way, shape, or form. It doesn't require sedation. It doesn't require hospitalization. Um, you can come to the treatment. Have it, you know, have your have be taken care of, have your treatment, and leave, go back to school or work, whatever you'd like to do. Um, how it works in the brain is by turning on neurons that have been dormant, and it does that by uh, electromagnetic pulse at about the same amount as, as an MRI machine, 1.5 to 2 Tesla, penetrates the the skin, the the uh, skull, and and all that magnetic pulse does is turn on neurons and get neurons to fire. It really is a concept of rebooting the brain or priming the pump, getting those things to turn on again. That's what antidepressants try to do but fail so often because people have polymorphisms that prohibit them from responding to a drug. Um, they're simply not capable of responding to a drug adequately. But what TMS does is it doesn't require a systemic approach. It's non-systemic. So there's no side effects. So I tell them there's no side effects. Um, there are really no downside. The worst side effect you could have, the, the FDA wanted to say, well, seizures. Oh, that scares people. The likelihood of having a seizure with TMS is about the same as having, uh, having a seizure after taking Prozac. It's about the same statistical possibility, quite remote, about one in maybe two million. So it's a very, very, very low instance of if someone does have a seizure, they probably have a co-occurring or uh, undiagnosed um, uh, problem. What kind of indications do you treat for here at Blackhawk TMS, and what indications have you seen the most success with for TMS? Well, TMS is only indicated for the, by the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA approves it only for depression, for those patients that have failed one antidepressant at or above the usual normal dosage, um, and so that's what the FDA says. Now the drug companies tend to uh, disagree with the Food and Drug Administration. So they say you must have failed four antidepressants, two augmentation, and, and some and some bona fide uh, type of uh, therapy, psychoanalytic therapy, relationship therapy, um, psychodynamic therapy, something that has to be documented. So um, um, patients can, uh, you know then be authorized by the insurance companies to be able to receive TMS. What indications do people typically think TMS might be good for, but it in fact isn't? Well, currently in the United States, the people are interested in treating uh, many different things for TMS. Depression, of course, is the authorized one, the only authorized one. Anything else besides depression is off-label. So if you're just treating anxiety, that's unfortunately off-label. It's very effective, um, but you put, should not treat uh, someone for it if they have a bona fide seizure disorder. So you would not want to, uh, but you, we, we said that initially, but now people are actually treating, using TMS to treat uh, patients with seizure disorder using low one hertz inhibitory to decrease the seizure threshold. So if you use a high frequency, 
um, excitatory pulse, certainly you can uh, bring on a seizure, but you can decrease the seizure threshold by doing one hertz inhibitory. What kind of pain is TMS good at treating? That's a real good question because TMS is now being seen as really being a harbinger of new developments in the, the whole treatment of pain, uh, migraine, uh, complex regional pain syndrome, uh, um, trigeminal neurology, which is just a burning sensation coming down to the facial muscles from the trigeminal nerve, often brought out by uh, a failed uh, uh, surgery for a, a sinus uh, problems. Uh, migraine is, of course, another. That's actually one of the only other FDA-approved treatments for uh, uh, TMS is to treat migraine, but it's done with a very small, ha handheld uh, machine called eNeura. Um, and actually, migraine is another one called cephaly that uh, is a um, transcranial direct current that fits right on the forehead. That seems to show some uh, efficacy, some help in treating migraine. So migraine pain. Um, all of the all of the neuropathies, diabetic neuropathies, trigeminal problems, um, neuropathic pain of any kind. Um, like I mentioned, complex regional pain syndrome. So right now, those are the things that we've found out that work so far. So would you say it's uh, or any any sort of neuropathic pain that's originating in the brain that is Correct. treatable? Correct. But other types of pain may be originating from trauma and other parts of the body. Not not so much. Not so much because that's that's a pain that actually is due to an injury. Right. Um, the referent pain from uh, the neuropathies is actually due to um, uh, an injury that did occur. But then what happens is the brain misinterprets the electrical impulses in that healing area and continues to. Um, um, decode the, those impulses as, as being painful. And so by tamping down the hyper-excitatory components of cortical excitation, uh, the pain is diminished. You had mentioned that you use uh, L-methylfolate um, in your patient population when you're treating with TMS. Can you explain why you use L-methylfolate? Absolutely. Uh, actually, there's a company called JMAC that produced something called Enlight and then uh, um, Enlight D, and what all re good research has shown is that 75% of patients with treatment-resistant depression have the inability to metabolize folate properly, just from folic acid down to L-methylfolate. And when this happens, the, when when the body stops producing um, um, things like neurotransmitters such as dopamine, norepinephrine, and uh, serotonin, that's stuff harbingers of depression. And so by augmenting the production instead of trying to keep what little neurotransmitters around, which is the, the antidepressant concept, is to keep what little neurotransmitters you have in the synapse. What this does is, in this looks at why you don't have enough neurotransmitters to start with. And so then uh, L-methylfolate helps you produce those neurotransmitters and often helps avoid the necessity for antidepressants at all. How do you know if somebody is uh, or, or needs uh, L-methylfolate to supplement with? A very, a very simple buccal swab test called an MTHFR polymorphism test. It's available now by most every um, um, uh, testing lab around LabCorp, Quest Diagnostics, all now on their uh, lab slip have the ability to do an MTHFR polymorphism. Now the drug companies probably knew the antidepressant manufacturers for years that this was a component of this. And um, you would think that somebody would have produced an L-methylfolate derivative long, long ago. Um, I wrote a paper called Brain Prep TMS with, in conjunction with JMAC Pharmaceuticals showing how it just makes good sense. And I tell anybody who does TMS that if you want to increase your odds of, life, of success with TMS, for God's sakes, put the person on L-methylfolate because <clears throat> here you have the production of the neurotransmitters and then you have the mechanism, the TMS machine, to get the neurons firing, and now they're going to learn how to fire and produce and, and release neurotransmitters on a much more robust level. It's just absolutely, it's a um, harmonious way of uh, approaching the treatment of depression. What other kinds of supplements do you give to or recommend for your patients? Well, besides Enlight D and Enlight, or a, if they're a woman, they can also get Embrace HR, which is Enlight also. Um, some good uh, over-the-counter supplements that you can buy are certainly, uh, we want to you want to stay healthy, so you want to have like N-acetylcysteine is very good, um, GABA is, is a good supplement for uh, anxiety. 
<coughs> all of these supplements work harmoniously and in conjunction with TMS, which is really important because a lot of these people come in with, you know, I call it sort of a raggedy brain. I mean, they've spent years on antidepressants that have um, impacted their ability to methylate properly or to uh, uh, their neurotransmitters have uh, been out of whack. So we have to restore the brain to health. And, and then with the addition of TMS, uh, we, we're re rebooting the brain. We're getting the brain to work um, the way it was designed to work. Tell us a little bit more about the, uh, the new research uh, around anhedonia with the ability, inability to feel pleasure and how TMS is helping people with this uh, more, it's more of a rare condition. It is somewhat, probably underrepresented quite actually. There's probably more people with depression that have a component of anhedonia than people realize because you can use an antidepressant uh, and, and talk therapy from now till the cows come home, <coughs> but if the person has a type of neurobiological anhedonia, they're simply not gonna experience pleasure. They can, their, their symptoms of depression will alleviate some, but the anhedonia, that inability to feel pleasure Imagine not being able to have that, that joyful feeling you experience as a child on Christmas morning, or <clears throat> if you're a musician, to play and feel that good, good feeling from performing a good musical piece. That's what anhedonia is all about. Anhedonia is the inability to feel pleasure in anything. It is a vacuum. It's like flatline. And so research has shown out of uh, Toronto Western that a different location to treat anhedonia, which is the dorsal orbital frontal cortex, and so right over the, on the right side of the right eye um, with inhibitory pulses goes a long way. So it's three, three things for one, decreases anxiety, alleviates depression, and alleviates anhedonia. It's fairly amazing. What, what kind of protocol do you use for that? AF8, which is a way to find the, uh, any TMS person knows the, the, the beam method for determining F3. Well, that was the old Tyrac method for determining the, the locations for EEG electrodes. And so we have F3, F4, dorsal medial, and AF8, which is the location for uh, just above the right eye to uh, stimulate with inhibitory pulses to be able to access the, uh, the anterior cingulate. Do you use a theta burst continuous protocol? You can use um, either a theta burst continuous, which is much shorter, because the one hertz inhibitory takes much longer, probably 1,200 seconds per treatment. 